Well, hello there. My name is Kelly Corsi Gray. Welcome to the Art of Photography lesson number five. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to reintroduce myself and show you again the person who is behind the voice of these lessons. So this is the Art of Photography and this is lesson number five. Can you believe it? So we've talked about a lot of the technical stuff with your camera, so uh, you should understand a little bit more about the settings as far as aperture and shutter priorities. But remember, we can take great pictures with this device that also makes phone calls. So think about this as a, an incredible tool um, to utilize out there these days since you always have it with you anyway. So let's get to today. I'm going to tell you a couple really fun stories and show you some examples of images that I've taken throughout my time in Alaska. Have fun out there and I'll see you again soon. Thus far in the series, we've, we've spoken about quite a few of the basics. Number one being you're taking a photograph of light falling on something. So this is an image I've used before of water and light falling on that water. We've also spoken about the trinity of photography in that light composition and the moment and subject are what make up your photograph. And we've spoken a little bit about each of these and this week we're going to talk more about putting the whole photograph together. Over the last few lessons, we've spoken about aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. We spent a little bit more time on aperture and shutter speed as ISO won't come into a lot of your photography with cell phones, except that as you take pictures in the dark, they'll be more pixelated. But these days, cell phones are doing incredible things with photography. We can imitate aperture by using our portrait mode, and we can imitate shutter speeds by using our live mode if you have those on your cell phone. So now that we've gotten the basics down, we're going to apply those lessons and talk a little bit more about the process of thinking about our photographs. Now I'm not an editorial photographer. Editorial photographers go out on the behalf of a magazine or newspaper or website and they bring back a series of images that will illustrate a story. But all of us are storytellers each and every day. And when you go out and do something really exciting, very often you want to commemorate that by taking pictures of this momentous event. So I wanted to show you a little picture story that I took the first time I went dog sledding on a glacier. Number one, you get to ride in a helicopter. So that's an experience in and of itself. And I always try, depending on how they situate us, to get a window seat and take pictures along the way. This isn't my helicopter, obviously. I'm already on the ground. And I took a picture of another one landing to give people the essence of what it's like to come down in the middle of a huge ice field on the top of a mountain in the middle of a glacier and then we got started with the dogs. So while I was looking out the window I saw these teeny tiny little ant-like forms these little dots down on the ground and you can see a bunch of activity I took a few pictures of this, but I wanted to make sure that I got the entirety of the scene. So you'll notice I took the picture in a vertical way so that I could get the dog camp. And that's what those little tiny bits are at the bottom of this picture. But I wanted to show just how beautiful the landscape was around it. So I took the picture vertically to show all of the mountains that were surrounding the camp and also to give you a sense of scale. Whenever you can include an element in your photographs that will give scale to the landscape, it's always a huge benefit. Now here we've gotten out of our chopper and we started to walk up to the dog camp. 
Now, these dogs each have their own houses, and at the beginning of the summer, the company flies up each dog and each house and food and all of the necessities for these dogs. And people live up here with the dogs all summer on the glacier. These people also pick up every single little thing. Yes, you got it. They pick up everything and they leave the glacier as beautiful as it was when they landed on it. So nothing has uh, changed in a bad way because the dogs are up here running and the dogs love to run on the snow. Very often, the people that do this are training for the Iditarod or other big races that are run. Uh, and these dogs love to mush, but this gives you another sense of scale with the tiny dog houses and these dogs and the mountains and such behind. Now here, I'm on a sled, but I'm taking pictures of a sled ahead of us. Again, I made sure to get the entirety of the background in so that you could see the scale of these dogs while they are mushing with the sled. Now, dog mushing is actually the state sport of Alaska. And most mushers train their dogs on land when there's no snow. A lot of people have the perception that Alaska is just a frozen tundra wonderland all year round. That's not actually the case. This is the top of a glacier, and this is where the only place in Alaska where the dogs can mush on snow during the summer season. So you can see there are two sleds and there's lots of dogs, and when the dogs see you and they know they're gonna get hooked up to their sled, they get incredibly excited. They do what I call a lift off. They just jump vertically, sometimes three, four feet in the air because they are ready to go. So you can't ever touch or pet the dogs until after you've ridden on the sleds with them. And then this is one of my favorite shots. This gives you the sense that you're behind the dogs. I'm on the front of the sled, the dogs are pulling us, and it is an absolute amazing scene. Now we lucked out with an absolutely beautiful, beautiful day. You can see the glacier is pristine. The dogs have a trail, they love to run. And this was truly one of the most exciting things that I've done ever. I also tried this vertically to show the sled. So I wanted to make sure that everyone got the understanding that I was on a dog sled and the dogs were pulling us. So I like this picture a lot because it shows the sled and the dogs. And if I had had my cell phone that could do panoramas, I probably would have attempted a panorama that would have included my feet. Now, after the dogs have run, after you've taken your sled ride, then they wanna meet you. They wanna kiss you, they wanna lick you, they want to be pet by you, and the dogs are just so happy. And they're really happy to be running on the snow, on the glacier. It's, uh, it's what they absolutely were born and bred and love to do. Now, speaking of breeding the dogs, one of the best aspects of this entire day is always meeting the puppies. Each year, all of the breeders breed a new set of puppies. They usually have a set of names for them. So, uh, for example, if they had seven puppies, they might name them after the seven dwarfs. Uh, there's usually a really clever, intriguing naming system, and these dogs are loving their life in the snow. And just to cap it all off, I got a picture of me with one of the puppies, and we always uh, made sure to tell our guests that they do check your coat pockets before you get back on the helicopter because people do try to take these gorgeous little puppies home. Now, I hope you enjoyed that story. And one of the aspects of it that I utilized was scale. I made sure in many of my images 
to tell the story of dog sledding that I put everything in the scale because one of the aspects of that experience is you're next to a glacier and the size of that glacier is just, it's overwhelming. And in general, the size of Alaska is overwhelming. So um, it's always nice to anchor what you're looking at with something to give you a sense of scale. And this is an important aspect and it's something that um, you should always try to add in your photos if possible depending on what you're taking the photograph for. But editorial photographers, they always try to put something with scale in their image. So I'm gonna tell you another story. I recently did a series of talks for a live audience and they told me that the most helpful aspect was when I explained my thought process and showed them the variety of photographs I took and then how I selected the image that I eventually um, put into a show. So I wanna take you through this particular image, which is an eagle sitting atop an iceberg up in Alaska, south of Juneau, Alaska, in the entrance to the Tracy Arm Fjord area. So I had gotten up very early in the morning and there were some bergy bits floating about in the landscape, which you can see here is quite substantial. And I don't know, nothing was really popping. I didn't see anything other than documenting kind of the general area as to something that I really wanted to focus in on. Then I saw this beautiful little misty cloud in the background. It kind of looked like fog, but it was just in one little area. And if I took a picture of just the fog, um, which I did, it really wasn't all that interesting. But if you include the entirety of the landscape, um, it had an interesting aspect, but I wasn't satisfied with this photograph either. Then I saw a few of the bergy bits in front of the fog and they were being backlit. So the light on the bergy bits was really quite spectacular. And I thought the shape of this one was quite nice. I thought the background was very minimal and non-distracting and you got some of the beautiful glacial blue colors. So. I was starting to get something that I thought might be a worthwhile image. Then I saw this berg and I saw the eagle perched atop this particular berg. And having recently discussed scale with a variety of people and trying to include things with scale in my images, I said, aha, I've seen a lot of bald eagles perched on icebergs, so it, it's not an unusual thing, but um, this picture didn't quite give me the mesmerizing scene that I was feeling at that time. It's sometimes hard to get a picture of the atmosphere that you're, you're feeling when you're out in nature. So then I saw the bergy bit in the little cloud off in the distance and I put the two together and in this case the bergy bit is is right in the center but I wanted to get the cloud I wanted to get the entirety of the landscape so I took a few shots but you can't even tell there's an eagle on that berg and this really it shows you the grandeur of Alaska but it doesn't really speak to anything else in my in my opinion so then I started to zoom in and I personally really utilize the zooms on my lenses and cameras that I have to frame my shots. Now I was thinking about the rule of thirds. So you can see this, this bird with the eagle is kind of in the, um, the top third of vertical and horizontal if you think of the tic-tac-toe board, but it's still, 
it's still uh, too far away. You really don't get very much of a sense of things here. So I tried down low in the bottom third to show a bit of the scenery to give the scale again. I tried vertical. You can see the cloud in the background and the bergy bit. You can see a dot on the bergy bit, but that's really as far as you can see. And then I started to get closer and I was on a ship, so uh, we were moving closer. And so the background is always changing, but remember you have feet and you can move yourself around to get different angles on the same scene. And that's something that I do quite often is I'll try it on one side, I'll try it on the other, I'll get low, I'll, get, I'll stand up high, but you have to try different things. Now this, I was somewhat satisfied with. I thought, aha, this is the beautiful landscape. You can see the clouds and the mountains in the background. And there's some light on the berg. You can see the forest. So I thought this was um, a fairly good image. But then I wanted to get closer. And as I got closer, I played around with the placement of the berg. And the light was changing based on the ship's movement and my movement. Here, the eagle is mostly in silhouette. You can make out that it is a bald eagle, but um, here uh, it's, it's coming along, but I'm not satisfied. So I'm taking a lot of images and that's something that most photographers will do. They will take a whole host of images. I, I probably had over a hundred images of this scene and I had many to choose from. Now, if you have a camera with a large sensor, um, for example, I'm shooting now with a Sony and my Sony is a full frame sensor. And so I could actually crop in on this image if I wanted to. Here, I like the berg, I like the light, I like the, uh, the lack of anything distracting, but I, it wasn't quite right. And then I came up with this. The foggy mist is in the back. The eagle is in the bottom third on the left. So it's kind of one of those key points that we look for as far as the rule of thirds. And the light on the berg is kind of, it's glowing. And the background is not distracting and it's quite mysterious. And so out of all the images I took, and I took a lot more than I showed you, I thought this was a, a pretty good image. And so I, I kept shooting. I always keep shooting, um, looking for the next thing. So I will take a whole series of images, then I'll move on to something else. Now, I like to enter contests and competitions, and for a while, National Geographic had something called Your Shot on a web page, and you could submit to a National Geographic Your Shot assignment, and the editors would choose the images they thought best fit the assignment that they had provided. And there was an assignment called keep still and from the description they wanted you to illustrate peacefulness tranquility and and I thought through a lot of my imagery and I said you know I have some really pretty stuff from the glaciers maybe I'll submit something and so I submitted a couple images to the National Geographic your shot and I was absolutely shocked when on July 11th, 2019, I woke up and I looked at my phone, I turned my phone on and all of a sudden it went and I looked and I got a notification that I was trending. Now, I didn't know exactly what that meant, but what it had meant is 
that this image was chosen as one of 12 images worldwide that was part of the daily dozen images for the day. And then they had everyone vote on the best image of the day. And I was in shock. I thought this was a beautiful image as far as keep still, but I certainly didn't think it was an award winner by any stretch. I thought it was a, a nice picture, but I was absolutely shocked. Now, because it did so well in the Daily Dozen, it was number three of the 12 after all the voting. And um, I'm always suspicious of online voting because who knows how many people, you know, pay for votes. I don't know, but I didn't. And I came in third and I thought, wow, that's really amazing. And I was entering another competition and I submitted this image because I figure, well, you know, certain people liked it and they're National Geographic. So why not give this a shot in this show? And I got an honorable mention in the International Photography Award. So I was really pretty thrilled that this particular image got so much acclaim. Now, I'm still a little shocked, but I definitely understand. It, it definitely has a peace and tranquilness to it. I think the blue is, is quite spectacular. There are many shades of blue. The eagle gives us a sense of scale. Um, the placement of the bird leads you in, and then there's a mystery because of the mist. So I definitely like this shot, but when I took it, I certainly did not think that it would be an award winner. Uh, but I'm thrilled that people liked it. So this is uh, Good Morning Eagle, and I was I was pretty thrilled, but I wanted to show you how I came about to choosing that final image. And I took probably, as I said, probably a hundred different shots that morning in the range of this image, but this one turned out to be, in my estimate, the keeper. And apparently other people thought so as well. Now, one word of caution about submitting your stuff to shows or competitions, you have to remember that it's always one or a couple people's opinion. And so if you like your image, that's great. Then keep shooting and find more images that you like. If you are trying to be a professional photographer, that's one thing. If you are just having some fun with your photography, that's another thing. Remember in the very first talk we did, we talked about, are you taking this to post on Facebook or Insta or Twitter or some other digital media? Are you taking it to hang on your wall? Are you taking it as a memory? All of these things are legitimate. Maybe you're just taking them for fun. Have fun with photography. Now, if you need a little inspiration, I recommend that you take a look at what other photographers have done. And you don't have to limit yourself to photographers. You can also be inspired by painters or chefs or all sorts of things. So I just wanted to show you a beautiful scene from Yellowstone. This is Thomas Moran's Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. And this painting, as well as other paintings and photographs, helped establish Yellowstone as the first national park in the world in 1873. This is a photograph of that same area. So you can see that the painting isn't necessarily a perfect rendition and I've taken many images over many different trips to Yellowstone of this area, and each one is different because of the time of day, because of the angle I choose, because of the placement of where I put the camera, the season, all sorts of different things. But you can be inspired by just about anything, and you can get out there and be creative with your photography. Remember, it's about you having fun with your photography. 
I really love the big landscapes and I think I'm drawn to them because I love to spend time out in the wilderness looking for places like this. And I also like to photograph these kinds of places. Another person very famous who loved to do the same was a gentleman by the name of Ansel Adams. Now he used, as you can see here, an eight by 10 camera. And these cameras, uh, much more difficult to utilize. You can see he set himself up on a car there. It's always tripoded, long exposures, and Ansel Adams was a perfectionist, and he would hike to places and wait for days for the right weather and the right look in his images. You can be inspired by anyone's photography, and I really encourage you to look for people's photography that you enjoy. And you don't necessarily want to go back out and recreate exactly what they've done, but use them for inspiration in your own work. So this is a really beautiful Ansel Adams image, and he was very specific in how he printed his images, and he and his sons are the only ones allowed to print his images. And uh, this one is quite abstract. I really like the color and the texture. Of course, it's black and white, but I like all the tonality of the grays here. And this is one of my favorites because it's one of my favorite places. This is the Snake River and the Tetons from the Teton National Park in Wyoming. So when I come across a big, bold, gorgeous scene like this one in Iceland, I try to get images that show just how spectacular these places are. I'll take many different photographs. I'll try a lot of different angles. I will, um, I will try the worm's eye view down low. I'll try a higher point of view. I will, um, this one I utilized the silhouetting technique and tried to just really focus on the shapes and then get the rest of the scene in, uh, in pristine color. Here I, I use the reflection of again the Tetons in the National Park and I thought the clouds and the mountains were really quite spectacular and I like to use leading lines and draw your eye the whole way around the scene. So I encourage you to, you know, get online and Google photographers. Uh, you can put in landscape photographers, wildlife photographers, portrait photographers, uh, product photographers. And there are some absolutely incredible people out there right now doing amazing and fun things. This is a scene from my local area. I took it because I wanted to show longer exposure. So this is uh, an image I took and I used a slower shutter speed so that I could get the water to be quite milky. Now that's this week's lesson. So your assignment this week is to find some inspiration and go outside and find a scene that you really like and try photographing it from numerous angles. Try it at different times of day to get different types of light. Take it vertically, take it horizontally. Try as many things as you can think of to get that one particular scene. Now remember, you have a digital camera or a phone, so it doesn't cost anything. Just take a lot of images. If you don't like them, you just delete them. Then look at your photographs and be critical and decide which one tells the story of the place. Which one do you find the most aesthetically pleasing? Think about that, give it a try, and post your favorites to the SAML webpage for this video. And I'll be happy to make comments because next week we will try another scenario and learn some other things about photography. So watch for the Art of Photography lesson number six next week with Kelly Corsi Gray. I appreciate your listening and give it a thumbs up 
a like and subscribe if you'd like to keep getting these videos. Thank you and have a great day taking pictures.